Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Third Impact Anime. I know it's very unusual for everyone to hear my voice host one of these things, but I am here, ready to do it, so bear with me. Slight chaos, but I don't operate any other way, so it's fine. I guess we're here for another mini episode of Third Impact Anime Book Club, sort of. Um, and I am here with my lovely co-host, Bill. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> I'm well. How are you? Good. Uh, I got my futon ready, and I, I just, I don't know, I don't feel comfortable, like, wanting to leave it, so I think I'm just going to stay in it while we record the podcast. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I've got my red turtleneck on, so it's, uh, you know, time to hold my head, um, <laughs> but... <laughs> So today we're going to be doing a discussion on the horror anthology Fragments of Horror by Jinji Ito, but before we get into all of that craziness, what have you been up to, Bill? Uh, Mostly watching Godzilla movies from uh, the 70s and 60s. All right. Uh, So I, as people of the podcast may, may or may not know, I've been on a big East Asian cinema kick. And so I was watching a lot of, like, wuxia and action movies. And uh, Hank had bought the giant Godzilla Showa era set. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Hank, you've had this thing for a year and a half. You haven't gotten through it, so let's get through it together. (laughs) So we we watched, like, one movie a day for a while. Uh, And my favorite part of the Godzilla series is... That I think sometimes when people think of foreign films, it's like, oh, this is high art, and this is of uh, of more higher quality. Whereas I would say with the Godzilla movies, they were just like an American studio following the trends and going mm-hmm. where the money was at. <laughs> because uh, the Godzilla movies at first uh, have a very kind of what we think of as the typical Godzilla affair. Then we go into like 60s space and then we do like a James Bond like movie on an island. Uh, So it seemed to me like watching the movies back to back, they were basically following the popular trends of the time. Mm -hmm. How do you think they, they hold up compared to like watching them now? Um, I love the miniature work because there's something just tactile about it. And just it's fun to see a man in a giant suit destroy a a miniature building. I know. I bet that's Uh, cathartic and for them in like a really weird way. (laughs) mm -hmm. Uh, I would say just don't go into this plot expecting... Uh, Citizen Kane, or or anything, <laughs> or or the Third Man. Like, it's uh, it's it's very simple. Uh, but if you kind of go into that and just just kind of let loose and not don't be pretentious about it, you can have a lot of fun with the movies. Nice, nice. Do you have one that you would recommend? Uh, probably destroy all monsters because it, that's just them throwing the kitchen sink at the wall and just like every monster, every single one of them is going to be in this movie and they're all going to fight and we're going to have giant explosions and tons of miniatures. They just went all out for it. All right. I'm going to have to add that to my letterbox. I, uh, have been enjoying seeing your updates as they come through on my feed. Um, but as for myself, I guess, I, this morning before work, finished off watching this horror movie. Uh, it's like a horror comedy starring Sebastian Stan and um, the main actress. I feel so bad. I can't remember her name, but she's in a lot of uh, book to movie to TV adaptations for some reason. Um, but this is an original story. The movie's called Fresh. And... Um, very very interesting i would um highly recommend it i think if you like that weird kind of like dark comedy type stuff um Mm -hmm. but i love sebastian stan seeing him in a role like that is because i'm so used to him being in superhero movies right so um Mm -hmm. seeing him in something so different he just nails it it was really incredible (laughs) 
That sounds really fun. Is it uh, streaming anywhere? Yeah, it is on Hulu. It's a Hulu original, so you can watch it there. Okay. I, mm-hmm. I like with these streaming services just kind of the, the weirdness that you can find like um, places like Shudder and on Hulu. I also recommend if you're a big horror fan, Arrow has their own streaming service I've been using, and they have a wide variety of uh, horror movies on there too. Yeah, they have a very interesting catalog. I was kind of browsing through like what they consider the cult films on there, like the you know like the cult classic sort of. Um, got a lot of stuff to watch now, so thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> There's just not enough hours in the day. There isn't. Um, but other other than that, I've just been plowing through those audiobooks, and uh, that's, that's about it for me. Nothing new. So that's what we've been up to, but uh, now it is time to get into the discussion, which I'm assuming is what everybody is tuning in for, um, on Fragments of Horror by Jinji Ito. This was published in 2015 by Viz, who tends to be the one who puts out his works. Think, Think big thanks to them. Um, for getting all of his stuff over here and continuing to release it, which is really, really awesome. So this this particular one, unlike some of the other collections that Viz releases and puts out, um, are actually all meant to be together. They're not a hodgepodge of kind of his works collected and just slapped together in a quote-unquote anthology. These were all released together originally, um, I believe, in 2008, Um, according to, or excuse me, 2006, according to his notes. Um, So they have a little bit of age on them. Um, Do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Just that it's interesting that unlike the other anthology collections that we've gotten here, this was one that was actually published the same way in Japan. Uh, Whereas usually we kind of get a hodgepodge of stories. And this one is also notable because... Besides Uzumaki, um, this is kind of the first anthology that Viz put out and kind of was a test of the water to see if, hey, would anyone be actually interested in buying this? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad they did because one, I bought it, two, you bought it, three, plenty of people (laughs) bought it. Um, But it's, it's always interesting because... Um, you know, we've done an episode on Jinji Ito before, and I don't want to go too much into the history, but a lot of his works are short form, like one shot stories. Um, so it was really interesting when we got like Tomie and Uzumaki here, and those were gaining traction. And a lot of people were like, oh, you know, he, he writes these really long stories that set up these worlds and these characters and things like this. But what he's most well known for, at least in my opinion, are these short form, like one shot stories. Yeah, I would say um, his short stories are his strength because I, I feel within the short story format, he's not, he doesn't have to really like give you a reason of why things are happening. He can leave you on a, like a great, like, oh, what happened? I don't understand it. And then just say, they, the end. Whereas in kind of his longer form stories like Uzumaki or Retina, he can kind of ramble and he doesn't always seem to stick the landing. But in these kind of short form format, I think is when he's at his best. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, all right, I guess let's jump into it. And the first story in this collection is called Futon, and it is about a uh, young man who was recently married, and 
long of the short, will not leave the safety and comfort of his futon due to the evil spirits that he sees floating around in their apartment. <laughs> uh, his poor wife. There, there's like a there's like a panel that is like she worked she worked all day and did all the cleaning and did all the cooking <laughs> and he never left except maybe go to the bathroom and I'm uh, just like this poor woman having to do all this work I know and I I don't even know if he got up to use the, the bathroom at all I don't think he left the I just, I just straight up think that or don't even think that he left the futon um this one to me was really interesting because I I get it. I um don't want to leave my bed either, but then when you kind of get to the like the the crux of it where he's with this other woman, I just like I don't know, you don't feel bad for him, I guess. <laughs> No, and they don't really give, like, a reason of how, like, how this happened. They just say, oh, I was with this other woman, and then I broke it off. Yeah. And, and, and that was it. But the, but again, again, as, I think we talked about this in the Uzumaki, rev- in the Uzumaki review we did, is Ito is not the best with women characters. So him kind of doing this kind of brazen of just like, oh, yeah, this happened. And that's it. I'm I'm not too surprised. Yeah, and um, kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but that is sort of a plot point in a couple of these stories. I was like, dang, what were you going through where you felt the need to write, like, three stories about cheating, Mr. Ito? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will say this story, uh, Futon has some... Uh, as always, some great splash pages. Yes. Um, especially, uh, also, if we didn't say this already, this is a spoiler podcast, so read, <laughs> read a book. Read the book. Read the book. I feel so bad for Austin editing this because, oh my gosh, there's one that I'm excited to talk about um, that it's just going to really suck for him when it gets spoiled. So apologies in advance. <laughs> Well, he'll he'll suck it up. Okay, it's like okay. Well, it's my fault. I should have read it forever because you've had the because I know you've had the book for a million years. Yes, so. that's it. That's his fault. True. Uh, true. 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 But just the the great splash pages of like when his wife finally sees the spirits that are above his bed. Yes, is, are amazing and they're so detailed with just so many different imageries throughout it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really entertaining. Or my other favorite one is when I think it's she lifts up the futon and you see like the, the all the like I don't know what you call it like the spider web. Yeah, it's like um, it's described as a spongy material, like a mold almost. So he's like molded into the futon. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I mean, I, I get it, but, <laughs> um, yeah, that, that splash page where the demons appear, I'm just looking at it right now and I'm thinking, oh my God, that would be one, an incredible wallpaper. And two, this is what HP Lovecraft wishes that he could have done. <laughs> <laughs> um, instead of just being like, it was so scary that I was too scared to describe it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I I think overall, like, the futon one holds up pretty, pretty solidly. And um, I would, I would definitely put that in a in a recommendation for people who just want to check out one shots of him because I think it's, it gives you a good kind of idea of what you expect from his stuff overall, I think. And it's really short. There's some uh, there's some longer form stories in here, but this one mm-hmm. I think is only like four or five pages. It's really short. Yeah, and um, that's not counting, but you know, two of them are full page artwork. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so yeah, that was Futon. And moving on to the next one, this is one of the ones that I was just like, ew, I shouldn't be reading this in public. Um, <laughs> It was, um, it's called Wooden Spirit, 
And to sum it up, it is about a young woman who shows up uninvited to a historical home um, what in the countryside. And typically they don't take visitors, but she just has to get in this house. Um, very, very much so literally and metaphorically. Um, and it kind of just devolves there with her turning into the house, um, becoming one with the house. So I, um, how'd you feel about this one, Bill? <laughs> I, I think the, the one image that sticks with me the most is when the daughter hears a noise and she goes up to the woman's room and she's completely naked and basically having sex with the wood of the, of the house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And just, I had to laugh just the absurdity of it. Because it's, it's just like, oh, how does that happen? It, where she, basically, she's just humping air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could, I could see why you wouldn't want to read this story, like, on the bus or, in this, or out in the public. Especially when you got to that panel, it's just like... Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. This one, this one, and the one about the woman wanting to be cut open, I was just like, okay, y'all gotta stop. I'm trying to be outside. <laughs> um, I just... Whenever I see these types of stories from Junji Ito, these are the ones, like, like, you know, I see some sometimes that are, like, like glycerized, the one with the people that live over the, the restaurant, and I'm just like, okay, yeah, that's gross, I get it, you know, um, this comes from a place of, like, him not liking to feel dirty or whatever, but, like, when I see this lady trying to just, like, fornicate with this house, I that's when I want to be in his mind and, and just know what's happening because, um, what the heck? And then, and then at the end, when it just, like, becomes covered in hair and it literally just looks like female anatomy, um, I was like, okay, I'm done. Mr. Ito, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think also just like even though his books are scary, there's some just like absurdity to it. To mm -hmm. Where there's certain panels, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna laugh at it because it's just so absurd. Doesn't make any sense. So just to her trying to have sex with the house just <laughs> just makes me just go like okay and start I, laughing. I know, and it, it's so it makes you laugh. At least me, like it makes me laugh because it's so uncomfortable. And I think this is a really good example of like um, something I talk about in my panel with Jinji Ito is like how he talks so much about obsession to the point of it being like like aversion or um oh what's the other word or just just like obsessive compulsion where you just have to you're so obsessed with something that you have to become it and that's kind of what this is where she just like literally becomes the house by mating with it so i don't know um i don't you know <laughs> I, I, I think this story teaches us that we we should step away from HDTV. Yes. And all the, all the house hunting shows, and just sometimes we just we gotta not we gotta not fetishize the the wood ceiling and the subway tile, and and uh, and the island countertops. We we just gotta step away. Yes. Um. And I would love to pick the Property Brothers' brains on this one. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would recommend this one to people, um, especially if they weren't familiar with what he does, because if somebody showed this to me and I wasn't already familiar with him, I'd be like, this is kind of weird and not like a good weird. <laughs> I'm going to steal like an old reference. I'm going to give it half thumbs up, half thumbs down. I'd be like... In the middle. Mm, okay, that's fair. I I can see that. Um, yeah, I I think if I reread this again, I would skip skip that one. But you know, anyway, mm. half a half thumbs up, half thumbs down. I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so the next one. 
tennis. It's the turtleneck one. Yes, is uh, Tomio Red Turtleneck. And this one is about Tomio. And he, unfortunately, even though he kind of deserved it, uh, gets cursed by a witch <laughs> um, who is obsessed with his head and wants to decapitate him because she thinks that his head is beautiful and she has to have it. This one, to me, is just... This is what it feels like to have a migraine headache. I'm just going to throw that out there. This is what it feels like to have a migraine <laughs> headache. Um, <laughs> I really, really like this one. Um, this is probably one of my go-to, like, if I'm not thinking of um, the Jinji Ito Big Three, which is Tomi, Gyo, and Uzumaki, I think of I think of the Red Turtleneck, because um, it's so iconic, I think. Yeah, especially just the image of just him just holding his hands up to his, like, ears. Yes. And, <laughs> and him just being so self-conscious of every movement he does. I think Jinji Ito does a great job of building the dread in this one, because when he gets into his uh, girlfriend's apartment and he finally convinces her, like, oh my god, she's cutting my head off, and if I move incorrectly, the whole thing's gonna come apart. And she's like, okay, well, you know, gently work your way down to the floor. And he's like, oh, I can feel my, like, vertebrae rubbing together. And I'm just like, oh, like, that's so, so gross. <laughs> I, I think the more visceral one for me is when the, the, the witch basically comes to his house, comes to the girlfriend's house, and when they, she thinks of the paramedics, and he, she puts a cockroach oh. down his neck, <laughs> and just the, the visceralness of just feeling that movement inside of you, and it's just like, ugh. yes, I know. Yeah. And she's like, okay, we can get it out. And he's like, no, don't worry about it. I've already swallowed it. <laughs> And I was like, oh no, like, oh gosh, just the, the thought of swallowing a cockroach just um, does something to me mentally. I, I can't. I, I mean, can't. I guess you you didn't watch Survivor like 20 years ago. No, <laughs> no. Because <laughs> they were like Fear Factor because they had to do those kind of dumb challenges of like, yeah, eat this cockroach. Eat this spider. Exactly. And I'm like, well, how does that cockroach and spider feel about it? I don't think they want a person to eat them. I don't want to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, were, they weren't given a paycheck to be on this show. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, unwilling participant. Um, the scene, too, right before that, where she, like, slices the death tarot card through his neck is really That's incredible. Great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great imagery of just like her, her the the witches uh, facing the girlfriend, and then with her showing the tarot card uh, mm -hmm. going against his neck. That's a great panel image. Yes, um, I just this is another one of those stories, short stories for me that I think just completely embodies everything that he does so well. It's got the like the gross out the like. You know, what is the logical conclusion of this? It's got the obsession. And then the fact that he walks away, like, like this is one of the first times, well, not, let me rephrase that. Like, this is one of the few instances where the main character comes out, like, alive. <laughs> um, but at what cost? Because he mm -hmm. is still obsessed with holding his hands over his head, you know? So... Um, and and it's kind of like, well, what's worse, dying or having to live with that for the rest of your life? Exactly. That's a good, that's a good existential question. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm not sure I would want to um, have to do that for the rest of my life. But out of this collection, this definitely would be one of the stories that I absolutely would recommend. Because, you know, just as I said, I think it embodies... Like, everything that makes his stuff so good um, in one kind of compact short story. So, um, mm -hmm. big fan of the Red Turtleneck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, two, two holding my hand, hands to my head up. <laughs> Thank you.
so the next one oh gosh this one i forgot what the twist was in this one and i was just like yeah he deserves it and then <laughs> and then the twist happened and i was just like oh i forgot that that's what, what i was like oh i forgot that that is what this was about and oh i feel so bad i'm gonna cry <laughs> Um, is this the that's we're talking about the the gentle gentle goodbye, gentle goodbye which is mm-hmm. about the after images right yes so um basically we have this young couple and she once again has her own obsession and it's about her ever since she was a child not wanting to lose her father she was very 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 afraid of her father dying And so she marries this young man and figures out that his family has the power to create after images of their family members after somebody dies. So they get together and basically like chant and pray and just concentrate and they're able to basically, you know, like I said, create that after image and she wants them to do one of her father when he dies and they're like no we can't do this and um time kind of goes on a little bit and she sees her husband with another woman and she confronts him and then you find out she's the one who's been dead all along that she died on their wedding day in a car accident so (laughs) <laughs> I, I hope I hope this doesn't sound like a put down, but it kind of reminds me of of uh, like an M Night Shyamalan type twist with her death. Maybe it's because it, it's reminding me of uh, oh, I, I'm being dumb. What's his his big his first movie? Sixth Sense. Yeah, the Sixth Sense. Mm-hmm. Um, well, one if it was anybody else who said that, I'd be like, hmm. But two, The Sixth Sense is also arguably his best film. So, (laughs) Um, yeah, I I can see that comparison. Definitely. Um, It's it's hard not to when you find when you hear or read a story that has to do with finding out somebody towards the end is dead. Um, But I the twist in this one which is you know her being dead it hits really hard like emotionally Mm -hmm. but also in the pacing of the story but not in a way that feels like it feels forced does that kind of make sense well and they give like good build up to it where her the her husband's family is very dismissive of her and you think oh it's for this reason yes like and just that build up of just like what's this happening and then him revealing at the end like i'm going to marry this other person to her and then him revealing what happened and i i think i don't I love the concept of this story. The, I think out of all the stories here, this is my favorite concept of his because it's asking you like, well, if you could bring like an image of someone you love that had passed on and they could kind of talk to you based off your memories of them, would you want to do that? Because it's basically like you have a little bit more time with them before they completely pass on, even if they're not really them. It's a very kind of sci-fi type premise Mm -hmm. and um it's very bittersweet too because i feel like you know any and everyone who's ever lost someone for the most part probably thinks oh you know i wish i would have gotten just 10 more minutes to spend with them and um to me he usually doesn't write such emotional stories like that um i mean like his his kind of autobiographical ones will get that way when he's sort of talking about like his family and his wife and stuff. But um, I'm having a hard time calling to mind like anything that's kind of like I'm really emotional like that <laughs> that he's done. <laughs> no, I, and unlike his other ones where it's very much kind of um, H.P. Lovecraft, like 
imagery. Mm-hmm. This one is is much more sincere. You still have like the creepy ghostly images, but for the most part, it's I would say this is less of a horror and more of just like a, a sad a sad drama. Yeah, in a way. definitely um, featuring ghosts. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, cool. All right, uh, should we move on to the next one? Uh, I would say this is probably my oh probably that's my right favorite sto- <laughs> it's my favorite story in the collection yes I will wholeheartedly agree with you I would 100% recommend this one even if it's not um, completely indicative of what he does but I think if somebody was looking to get into Jinji Ito and didn't want something super gross out that this probably would be a really good recommendation for them so and uh if tori if, if you have to take my horror card away for for uh because i mentioned in my channel and i can completely understand <laughs> I, i'll send it to you in the mail oh my uh, gosh i'm I, i'm sorry I, I shouldn't have spoken on their name. Uh, the card will be coming in the mail, but hopefully by next month. Oh my gosh, no. Um, one, I very genuinely like the Sixth Sense, so it's okay. And um, two, watch Malignant, and I'll I'll restore the card. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that was that was gentle goodbye. Um, next up in the anthology, we have Dissection John. Uh, I I don't even know what this one. This was the other one I was talking about that I was reading in public, and I was like, "Girl, you need to put those away." <laughs> I, ba- the basic plot of this one is this girl <laughs> loves dissections. She would love biology class in a movie because at first, um, she and her childhood friend, who's a boy whose father is a doctor, um her playing doctor and she's like I want to dissect something and he steals a knife for her and they just sort of dissect kind of the usual fare of like frogs and I think a few other creatures and then eventually she gets to the point where I want to dissect myself and then we kind of at the beginning of the story it's him in a medical school where they're dissecting bodies and she puts herself as one of the corpses that they dissect on for practice, but she's alive. And she, all this, all the story is basically is her, him, her just going to him, just like begging, like dissect me, please, please dissect me, please. Will please. you cut me open now? No. How about now? No. How, how about now? And I, I, I didn't like the story at all. Um. <laughs> This is I I I think the gag of her putting herself in the the body bag to get cut open is really funny, but like I agree. Um, I this is probably one of my least favorites. I have a hard time with animal cruelty and um, just the the cutting open of the animals, even though only one is a little graphic, uh, was just enough for me to be like. Mm. But, um, it definitely calls on that obsession that he's so good at writing. Like, she literally just wants to be cut open, and she gets it at the end. Um, and boy, I, what a I, what a page turn that is. <laughs> I, I feel like this story would be better if it was, like, kind of the size of Futon. Because I feel like the story is a little too long for its premise. Yes, it goes on a little too long. I'd say it's about, let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. It's about 30 pages. Um, and that, that for that subject material, I agree. I think it definitely could have um, benefited from <laughs> being cut Some a little it- bit. <laughs> Like I, I don't know if if Ito is so big where he do, he's like no editor can say what I want to say to say what I ha- get to do in terms of page count, mm-hmm. but uh, maybe like an editor here would have been would have been good because I think the story for me would have had a much bigger impact and been more interesting if it was shorter. Oh yeah, I um. 
would definitely love to hear more about his editing process. And I actually didn't come across a whole lot of that, like, researching. So if anybody knows anything about that, please, like, message me on Twitter and let me know. Because I am, I'm dying to know, like, what his, <clears throat> excuse me, I am dying to know what his editor actually does in terms of being like, hey, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, I I think you know my stance on this story. I'm giving it a thumbs down. Yeah, I would not recommend this one for anyone other than people who really already like love Jinji Ito and want to just kind of read everything that he's done. So that that's kind of where I stand with that one. I get it. I get it. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, that was Dissection Chan, and we are moving on to Blackbird. Um, do you want to summarize this one as well? Yeah, basically, cool. uh, a man was hiking, and he falls down like a cliffside, and he's basically stranded there. A mysterious woman comes to him and basically feeds him, um, which sustains his him from dying then he's eventually found but the woman keeps appearing at night and we basically learn that the woman is like this bird-like creature and is and when you first see the food that he's that she's giving him it kind of looks like um coughed up bird food that a mother would give um a bird mother would give like her young chick um and basically, uh, she we basically learned that the young the the bird woman is giving like the man's own insights to him. Because <laughs> <laughs> of course she is. Because of course she is, and eventually they both of him and the person that found him are trying to just like. Uh, the man who created Frankenstein just trying to run away and hide from the bird woman, but the bird woman is always able to find them. Yeah. Um, this one was really absurd, but in a cool way. And mm -hmm. um, I, I really liked it. Like when she shows up at the end as the big bird with her face, um, that was, that was freaky. Um, I, I really enjoyed this one. So, yeah. um, I think what makes this story great is uh, one, it's got a good central mystery of like who is this woman and what is she doing, and also she has a great character design. Yes, <laughs> um, it definitely plays on those fears of like, oh, I was just out having a good time and then I fell and that's already horrific like you know being trapped in the woods um hoping somebody's gonna find you while you're hiking I mean you hear so many crazy stories about people getting lost in the woods and like weird things happening but um I don't know what I would do if I got injured while hiking and some bird lady started feeding me bits of myself <laughs> Well, and it's also like, you. What are you gonna do? You can either say no. You can either ignore her, and potentially die, or you can eat whatever you, you can eat your own self <laughs> and live. I know. Um, I'm sure there's a like a metaphor in there somewhere for letting yourself be consumed by what you love doing, but I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um gosh and then his poor friend at the end who's basically having the same thing happen to him and it's already bad enough that one guy went through it i hate to you know see somebody else go through it <laughs> yeah and it, it kind of ends on a uh, frankenstein ending where he is just trying to hide and be on the constant run um which is kind of an interesting, was an interesting kind of uh, reference to me, maybe, maybe in my own head. Mm hmm. Yeah, I didn't even uh, draw that, but that's a that's a really good one. So I, I can see where you're coming from on that one. 
but I, uh, overall, I I really like this story. I, I I recommend it. Me me too. Um, I think it does a good job at kind of showcasing the way he like we've talked about already. Just being like, oh, this is what's happening, and yes, it's weird, and we're not going to give you any explanation for it. But I think that helps because you're kind of left on a what in the world did I just read? And it kind of, um, when, when you, ha- I think that's one thing that especially like Hollywood movies fall into the pit trap of like, well, we have to explain it. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. What, what, because w- the mystery of it and what someone can create in their own head is better than whatever you, you could write. Exactly. And it's it's so fun when a story or a movie um, kind of gives you the lore through little details of the world or like through conversations and things like that. And then like you said, you put it together and probably what I come up with might be slightly better than, you know, what the directors potentially or the writers potentially could have done. Um not everything has to be uh, show and tell. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, yeah, so that was Blackbird. And then moving on to... Actually, this might be my least favorite in this entire anthology, but the story can, called... Can, um, could you explain it to me? Because I'm confused by it. I didn't get it either, and I was... Okay, so the next story is Megami Nanakuse, and um, it is about an author, and I don't know how to explain anything other than that. And I was reading, like, reviews and stuff, and apparently no else really seemed to get it either so I'm I'm thinking that this must be something personal <laughs> um, which to me I guess what I kind of took from it was that like one don't meet your heroes and two that once again like don't let what you love consume you because these people were so into these books that they were trying to replicate like what they were doing in the books and then I guess these people were trying to like become inspiration for this particular author and I I don't know your guess is as good as mine actually so I I don't understand this one and I will admit it (laughs) and this and the author is a horrible person yes treats all the treats the fans um horribly like she's a prison underneath her house for them and then i i don't under i'm confused by like the the, the main female characters in this movie is the, in the it's that movie <laughs> in, in the story uh basically reveals that the author is wearing a wig and I don't. I don't understand the the gender. Right. The gender of the of the, of the author doesn't matter, but it's you could you could interpret that in in some negative ways and why Ito decided to go that route, and it was just it's just confusing to me. The only reason I could see of it is like what you said of just like don't meet your heroes, the relationship between creator and fan. Mm-hmm. But the, but that but that message gets really muddled. Oh, definitely towards the, the end. A, yeah, especially with this kind of the manicness of the story. Yes, because the author is very over the top, and I I don't think it's purposefully supposed to be like an offensive stereotype, but it kind of like comes across that way because like is this author supposed to be a trans woman or they refer to her as like a man in a dress and a wig um and then kind of like the the mannerisms and the the actions are a little what could be considered stereotypical but like Mm -hmm. that's that's nothing that's really ever come across in Ito's work before um so I'm very confused (laughs) Um, and I, I don't think we're the only two that feel that way on this particular one. <laughs> the only compliment I can kind of give the story is 
the great over the top like dramatic like the what faces like from the main character yes are, are entertaining <laughs> but that's the only thing out of the story that i that i enjoyed to any degree yeah the facial expressions are definitely very wacky and that's pretty fun um maybe it was supposed to just be an exercise in Jinji Ito drawing wacky facial expressions. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Listener, if you decide to read this collection, maybe you can tell us your thoughts on the story and, <laughs> and tell us what you think about it. and Maybe tell us what, what, what the actual point of it was. I know. I need someone to at me on Twitter and be like, well, actually, um, you uh, just no, didn't no, get no, it. Don't, don't. <laughs> Don't do that to, to, to Tori. Do that to me. <laughs> Tori doesn't have Tori doesn't have time for that crap. Oh my just, gosh! Just, 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 just direct all that crap to me. I, I can deal with it. Oh, you hear that, you people? You be mean to me, and I'll sick Bill on you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, I would not recommend uh, the Megami Nanakuse story at all because it's just too highbrow for me i suppose <laughs> and to equal you out i guess i'll say thumbs down for me because i think it was too lowbrow so <laughs> you just de- you decide it's a listener. it's a solid middle brow <laughs> <laughs> yeah brings us to the last story in the anthology which is the whispering woman do you want to summarize that one yeah basically it's about this girl who is just she can't make a decision to save her life in terms of like what she does like do i sit down do i stand up do i use the spoon do i use this fork uh, she is a very wealthy father that had basically like babysitters that would help her, but eventually the babysitters couldn't stand it because she couldn't do the most basic things because she would need guidance on every single detail. And eventually she finds this woman, this woman who is able to basically calm her down and is able to maintain the speed where i think they say in the story like she's working like 16 to 18 hour days Mm -hmm. with this girl and it's later the the husband the father gets suspicious because she's near perfect this sitter um there's no way she can do this how is this possible he hires a detective the detective finds out that she is in a very abusive, horrible relationship with this man. It's basically treating her like crap in terms of it's it's implied physical abuse, and also just spending her money on his own whims, women, um, cars, booze, that type of thing. And then eventually, um, the sit I think the sitter the sitter dies. Because uh, the sitter basically at a certain point is just constantly whispering into the girl's ear. all Like, kind of like a snake a snake would do in like a fable story. Mm-hmm. Um, and the father can never understand what she's saying. And then eventually the, the, the sitter dies and the girl goes out and kills her husband. Because the sitter told her to do that. And that's where we end our story. Yeah, um, that one is definitely pretty heavy. (laughs) Um, And I say that in the same breath that I say for those who 
do not struggle with ADHD. Um, if you've ever heard the phrase executive dysfunction, uh, this is kind of what it's like. <laughs> um, being paralyzed by choice. Um, and this one kind of kind of hit home for me because of that, because I just, what do you do? Either I have everything I need to do, but I can't do it because there's too much to do. And because there's too much to do, I'm going to do nothing. So I need somebody to tell me what to do. Um, and it's just, I love the progression of how she begins to trust the helper. And then it just, zero to 100 really quick go kill my husband and then she does <laughs> and that's where we end the story yes <laughs> um i i for the the one time i wish that that one would have been a little bit longer because i wanted to see the aftermath of what actually happened like yes i can think about it all day long but i very genuinely want to see it <laughs> what i really like about the story is like you said i love the progression of the plot mm-hmm. like just the slow build of just the relationship between the sitter and the girl and also just that the the dark lines he uses on and the just the heavy line work that he uses on the the, the helper because she just become she is all she almost has like a, de- a decaying look to her with just the bags over her eyes and just the the heaviness and the hunch uh, that she walks mm-hmm. um just again another really good and interesting character design yeah and um i kind of wonder like i'm going back and looking like i kind of wonder if at some point in the middle of their interactions that she had been killed and was kind of dead to start with. Um, cause that, or not to start with at the complete beginning, but at some point within the middle of the story, had she been killed by her husband and it was her spirit that was guiding the girl. Um, cause I could see that. I could see that happening. <laughs> they, they do, they do hint at that, but they don't give you a definitive, like, yeah, that was the case. Mm, okay. Yeah. So, I don't know. I feel like the story is more fun when you think about it that way. I mean, not that that's fun subject matter, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> mm-hmm. so. I think also what's interesting to me is this is the first story or the only story here that doesn't have like, for the most part, doesn't have a supernatural element. Like if you could you could think that the the sitter or the helper is a ghost, but they don't really imply that. Mm-mm. Um, so this could be straight up like in a detective Conan plot. Yeah, uh, if, if you wanted it to. <laughs> yes, and um, I I think his stories are very interesting when he bases them more in reality because you're so expectant for it to be some otherworldly creature that when you're like oh that one actually really could happen people get manipulated like that pretty easily actually um so yeah there's no reason that that couldn't happen in real life (laughs) but yeah i would definitely recommend the whispering woman i think it's i keep saying this for a lot of these but this is a, a very solid um collection of stories and once again this one really shines in showing what he does best with his short form stories yeah and i i think what uh, i like about the form the format of anthologies is like i can't think of a perfect anthology there's always going to be that that (laughs) that up that up and down of like and it's always going to be subjective of depending on the reader of like well i like this one i don't like that one so, but I think that's what makes it, that that's why I love the anthology format, whether that's in a book or that's in a, in a film or TV series is just, everyone's going to have a wide ranging of opinions and it's going to go all over the place in terms of your perspective and viewpoint on an anthology work. 
Totally, totally agree. Um, I definitely, this makes me want to revisit some of my favorite horror anthologies now, but um, in terms of his other short story collections, how do you feel that this kind of compares? Because I just recently had to read Shiver um, for my local book club, and I don't think I like Shiver as much as I like this one, even not liking two of the stories. <laughs> I think what helps is this collection is much smaller than the usual collections we've been getting now. Mm. Because, like, the collections like Shiver, Deserter, Smash are these 400 page behemoths. Where uh, I'll say, if you're looking for like mu- uh, best value, those books you get a lot for like t- usually you can get them for like 20 bucks. Yes. Or, t- um, so you're getting a lot of value, but because this is a much smaller collection, it's less intimidating to, I would say, a new reader to Ito's work. And it's more of an introductory um, reading because it's only eight short stories. It's about like 130 to 40 pages. Um, so I would say this is on the on the higher end for me of his collections and also just a great uh, a much easier introduction and a breezier read than his his more recent collections. Yeah, definitely. So it sounds like we're both in agreement on recommending it to those who are new to Edo work or those who haven't read it yet and might be familiar with Edo work. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's a, a pretty pretty good little short story collection. Well, I'll I'll say kind of as a, a final coda. Yeah. To this is, uh, I love that they we're kind of having like a horror manga renaissance. Yes. Because <laughs> it's like on top of we we usually get like two Ita books a year, and then on top of that, Om- Omez's work, who did Drifting Classroom, another one of his stories is coming out. Uh, I think this month. Then you have. Um, uh, PTSD Radio is getting a physical release. Yes, I did not know that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and a couple other... Uh, 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 I, I hope I'm getting the author's name right, but uh, the creator of Mermaid Saga, uh, Rumiko Takahashi. Yep, uh-huh. Hooray, right, I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, uh, she, has, she just had another sort of horror anthology come out this... February, um, and we're getting more horror author uh, being published by uh, Seven Seas and Viz. So it's just it's a good time to be a horror fan. Yeah, and um, you've been sending me some stuff from that small. Are they like an indie? They're like an indie publisher, sort of, right? Um, Star Fruit. Yeah, yeah. Like I think it's like Star Fruit Books. They uh, they're doing a Bay of I think it's called Bay of Pigs. Mm-hmm. Um, which is another horror book by a smaller uh, manga creator. Um, yeah, just there's a there's a great renaissance of just smaller publishers too, like um, Starfruit Books and Glacier B- B- Glacier Bay Publishing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I just it's it's just a good time to be a fan. It is. It really is, and um, we're getting blessed with some like really new good horror video games this year as well, and. Um... I mean, the movies keep coming and they don't stop coming. So (laughs) Um, I know really looking forward to there is a Korean horror movie coming out starring Sandra Oh, and I adore her and I cannot wait to see her in this horror movie. But um, yeah, you're right. It's it's a fantastic time right now to be a horror fan. So I feel like we're getting I feel like we're getting spoiled. (laughs) And you have so many great services like shutter and arrow and uh scream factory shop factories label so mm-hmm. you're, you're there's 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 no shortages of things you can check out definitely not well i think that does it on our third impact anime book corner uh hopefully i will be able to make this a regular thing Um, whether it be with Bill or anyone else uh, in the crew who wants to sit down and 
read a manga or light novel or something of the sort with me. But um, I had a really good time talking about this. I hope you did too, Bill. <laughs> oh, no, I love doing this. I would love to continue to do more Third Impact Book Club episodes in the future. So Sweet. Well, that, that sounds great. Well, as always, you can find us on Twitter at TI underscore anime. I did get that right, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it left my mouth, and I was like, "Oh my god, that's all right." Um, no, no, I, I think I think you got it. If it's wrong, Austin. Austin will just come pop in. in, and Austin will pop in and just say, "No, Tori, no, Tori, no, Bill." I, I'll, I'll, I'll say the same show um, and put it in and, and give us the correct exactly. Yeah, I believe. It. I believe so. I believe that. Okay, it. I at least know the website, and that's thirdimpactanime.com, guys. So you can check us out <laughs> there too. <laughs> um, and Bill, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at wbforman999. Uh, uh, you know, I should also post my letterbox. Uh, profile because yeah. as Tor as Tori says, I'm usually watching like a re- insanely like a movie a day. So <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you like East Asian cinema and noir movies, uh yeah, ch- come check out my letterbox. I'll I'll have it up in my uh Twitter by the time this episode comes out and so you can check it out there. Cool. That sounds awesome. I like I said, I I like seeing your and hearing your movie takes. So that'll be something for the folks to look forward to. And as usual, you guys can find me at Worst Waifu. I'm usually talking about whatever's going on in the day, uh, talking about books, movies, music, all that fun stuff. And that's it for us, guys. Um, Make sure you change your futon sheets. And uh, don't let a whispering lady convince you to kill her husband in the middle of the night. Yep, so many lessons to take away. I know. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye.